A few years ago, Julian and I were walking in Glasgow, in the beautiful, beautiful Glasgow in Scotland. And um, we were walking the streets and suddenly we started to hear this incredible sound as we were walking. And it, it was literally filling the streets. We initially couldn't see where the sound was coming from, but as we rounded a corner, we saw the, uh, where the um, sound was originating. And there was this group of Scottish uh, pipers and drummers. Um, and they looked exactly how you would expect. They were all wearing their kilts. They had wild, long hair and big bushy beards, they were playing the pipes and they were playing the drums and the sound was literally filling and flooding the streets. It was one of those powerful moments, I don't know if you have kind of memories like this, that just you, you as soon as you close your eyes, you're back in that moment. It was powerful, there was goosebumps all over us as this sound of a kingdom invaded. You know, Scottish pipers and drummers would walk before the Scottish army because they would make the sound of their kingdom to announce the army coming. And as we stood there that day, and I felt the presence of God even as these guys were playing their music, I felt reminded of the sound of the kingdom of God that is in us and is to come out of us. You know, you and I are part of a kingdom. It's not, Christianity isn't just us sitting on our pews every Sunday doing the right thing, doing the moral thing, occasionally telling our work colleagues that we're Christians and then going back to our tidy lives. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is about joining our lives with Jesus who is the king of a kingdom and as we join our lives to his, we become heirs of that very same kingdom. We become gatekeepers of that very same kingdom, we become doorways of that very same kingdom on the earth. That's why you are on planet earth, by the way, if you ever wonder what your destiny is or what your calling is. Your destiny and your calling is to literally be an open doorway of the kingdom of heaven so when people encounter you, they see into the heavenly realm. That's your destiny and your calling. And the book of Matthew in the New Testament is a book all about the king and his kingdom. It starts with the royal lineage of the king. It then goes on to chart the proclamation and the demonstration of that kingdom. Jesus starts saying, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is at hand, and he demonstrates it every time with the power of that kingdom. And then towards the end of the book, you get to the pivotal, inspiring, profound, horrific battle of the kingdom where the king is crucified and the enemy thinks he's won and yet three days later, everything changes and nothing is ever the same again. And right at the end of the book of Matthew, the king commissions his people to invade the world with the reality of the kingdom of heaven and to make disciples of nations, individuals, and nations. Incidentally, you and I are to disciple nations as well as individuals. You and I are to shape the culture of nations as well as the individual right in front of us. And so today we're going to look at at this kingdom, the nature of the sound of this kingdom. And we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus, we're told, sits down on a mountainside, which was the posture of a teacher. He's being, if you like, the new Moses for the people of God. And he sits down and he begins to make the sounds of his kingdom. And this is what he says Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see 
God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are you when you were persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus opens his mouth. He begins to make the sounds of his kingdom. And in that moment, the world is turned upside down because his, the sound that he makes makes no sense at all. All. It is confusing. It is the wrong way round. It is not what anyone expected. In fact, it's incredibly offensive. And that's a really good introduction to Jesus because he is the king of an upside down kingdom. Everyone in the crowd, these Jewish people, thought they knew the plan that God had charted for history. They thought they were accurate in what they were expecting. They'd been praying and expecting and anticipating for years. And when they spot Jesus and they see this radical guy and he seems to be super charismatic and look, hundreds and thousands are gathering to him. They're thinking, is this the one? And then he sits on a mountainside and he begins to speak and they're thinking, this must be the one. This here, this is Moses for us. This is the Messiah. Messiah. And he begins to make sounds and they make no sense. That's not what they were expecting. They were expecting the Messiah to come to put Israel at the top of the food chain. They were expecting the Messiah to come to crush their enemies. Wait, peacemakers? No, no, he can't be getting it right. Sorry, persecution? What on earth is he talking about? Poverty? Mourning? Hunger? These are not the sounds of the kingdom that they are expecting. They're upside down. Or maybe, perhaps, we're the ones who are upside down. How many of us in our wonderful modern day culture are pursuing poverty of spirit, mourning, hunger? How many of our church programs are built to this? Let's forget about the world for a moment. Like, how many of our churches are pursuing persecution as something that we can be joy-filled about? How many of us are high-fiving when we come and tell testimonies of how everyone is insulting us because we're Christians? It's not the sounds of a kingdom that we expect, and it's certainly not a sound of a kingdom that is th the world is expecting. This is a kingdom where the poor are lifted and seated with princes. This is a kingdom where the least are greatest. This is a kingdom where the last are first. This is a kingdom where weakness attracts power, not strength. And we can read all those verses and we can nod our heads and yet every single one of us has this wiring to somehow make ourselves stronger so that we will be useful in the kingdom. I wanna tell you, God is not attracted to your strength. He's attracted to your weakness. The very thing that you think disqualifies you is the very thing, I'm not talking about sin, so that's a different conversation, but the very weakness, the insecurities, the thing that you think, I'm not strong enough, I'm not clever enough, I'm not uh, eloquent enough, that very thing is the thing that God wants to create as the platform that attracts his power to come and do the miracle. Miraculous. I want to say this your Enneagram is not the route to your destiny. Your personality testing, as good and as helpful it can be, I can tell you my Enneagram number, I can tell you my Myers-Briggs, those things are great and helpful tools, but we are using them wrong if we think we get the answer and that points to our destiny. We do not understand the way the upside down kingdom works if we're looking to our Enneagram to decipher your calling. Your strengths will not define your calling. You're looking in the wrong place. Isn't it fascinating that Jesus calls 
Peter, who was a high school dropout. That's how people became fishermen. That's how Jews became fishermen because the way it worked in Jewish, ancient Judaism is that the education system was designed like this, that all the boys would go to school, but it was only the ones that were actually shown to have an aptitude to memorize the scriptures that would stay in school. All of the rest that failed school would be sent out to learn a trade. So if you are a fisherman, if you were a carpenter, if you were anyone who wasn't a rabbi, that meant you had failed. Isn't it interesting then that Jesus picks Peter, the high school dropout of Judaism, to go and minister to the Jews, and he picks Paul, the expert in Jewish law, to go and minister to the Gentiles? If you're looking at your strength in order to see your destiny, you are looking in the wrong place because you belong to an upside down kingdom. As people of this kingdom, I wonder if we make too much sense to the world around us. See, Jesus consistently made sounds that were upside down and people were confused and offended by him. As people of the very same kingdom, I wonder if our lives are making too much sense. I wonder if our non-Christian accountants are far too happy with the way we handle our finances. I wonder if our non-Christian friends find the way we love people perfectly logical. I wonder if our non-Christian communities look at the way we forgive and think that's wise. If you and I are making too much sense, there's a problem. If you and I need a badge to tell people we're Christians, rather than the upside down nature of the way we live our lives, then there's a problem. I think of the bishop who said, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, they serve me tea. I wonder if we're being served too many cups of tea because our lives are far too wise in accordance to the wisdom of the world and no one thinks that we're part of anything that's upside down at all. The problem is if you're making too much sense, you are holding no power to bring transformation. He's the king of an upside down kingdom. I'm talking about living lives that are so radically full of love that people have to stop and ask, why are you doing what you're doing? I'm talking about forgiving those who are undeserving, just like you and me, by the way, so that people have to stop and say, I don't think that's wise. I'm talking about being so generous with our finances that your accountant says, you cannot keep giving like this because one day you'll go broke and then you say, am I going broke? And they go, I don't actually understand it because it seems that your money is getting more, but still I would advise that you don't do what you're doing. I'm talking not about being weird. I'm talking about bringing kingdom life which will not line up to the wisdom of the world but will bring incredible life and freedom wherever you go he is the king of an upside down kingdom but the challenge of course is that the kingdom is not just upside down it's offensive listen to these words in 1 Corinthians 1 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. He's the king of an offensive kingdom. Sometimes we read the words of Matthew 5 like it's sweet poetry. You get like sweet poetry. Christian cards with these words. Uh, We've reduced the power of these words, the radical nature of these words to something that's sickly sweet rather than the spiritual torpedoes that they were. These were not sweet words. These were words that hit the audience and affected 
offended their minds because when they heard the words, they were not only thinking this makes no sense, they were thinking, how dare you say what you're saying? Because these words are an offense to the religious spirit. The religious leaders of Jesus' day didn't say that poverty of spirit was strength. They didn't say that meekness was the way forward. They didn't say that hunger looked like the blessing of God. They didn't say any of those things because the religious leaders said those who are the law keepers will see the face of God. They said those who are able to keep the rules will see the kingdom come. Those who are morally on the high ground will inherit the kingdom. And everything that Jesus said undid their religious mindsets, unraveled the lifestyle that they'd worked so hard to to build and to make others believe. I wanna tell you, if you're a Christian here thinking that your Christianity is about your morality, God is gonna affect offend you because Christianity has got nothing to do with your ability to keep the rules. It has got everything to do with the kindness of a king of an upside down kingdom. We're all on the same moral ground, which is nowhere. No matter how good you are, your goodness isn't enough. That's the point of the gospel. And you see this moment in Matthew 15 where Jesus is speaking to the crowds and he rebukes the Pharisees who were the teachers of the law of his day. And he starts saying to them, you keep telling people that what goes inside of them makes them unclean. You have all these rituals about washing and about eating certain things, but I tell you, it's what comes out of you that makes you unclean. And his disciples draw him aside and say, don't you know that what you said offended the Pharisees? I think he got that. (laughs) But he was undeterred by the religious spirit that found the sound of his kingdom incredibly offensive. This conference has been all about, and I know the culture of this community is about pursuing the presence of God because without the king of the kingdom in our midst, the kingdom is irrelevant but pursuing the presence of God will offend the religious spirit because the religious spirit likes what it can control. But the king of the kingdom will not be controlled. You're a part of an offensive kingdom, not offensive in manner, hear me. We don't walk out the doors and just be rude and then blame it on God. (laughs) You know, it's fascinating. You read the story of the disciples in Acts, the apostles, all the things they did, all the horrific persecution they faced. You will not see their manner be the problem. In fact, they try to work within the rules. In fact, they try to honor those who are persecuting them. In fact, they try to somehow help. They try to work, and yet they will not compromise on the sound that they make. I want to tell you, you're part of an offensive kingdom by the nature of the sound that it makes, but make sure your manner is full of love and honor and grace wherever you go. It's not an, only an offense to the religious spirit, it's an offense to the wisdom of the age because the mathematics of the kingdom makes no sense on this earth. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus goes to his hometown and he starts speaking with authority. And you know what the wisdom of the age says? Hey, we know this guy. Isn't he that son of Joseph? They, they actually had sex out of, outside of marriage, by the way. It's really, really bad. Really, it's just a shame. Isn't he that guy? Like, his whole, his whole thing is shrouded in shame and disgrace. And here he is, all of a sudden, like, acting like he's somebody. We know who you are. We grew up with you. The wisdom of the age. And it says that they were offended with him so that he could not do many miracles in their midst. The wisdom of the age will never understand the supernatural, wild, crazy nature of this upside down kingdom and will consistently be offended by it. 
Are you asking questions when you weigh up your decisions according to the wisdom of the age or according to the wisdom of the kingdom? They're completely different in how they see things. The wisdom of the age will consistently say one plus one equals two. The wisdom of the kingdom will give you a completely different number depending on what God is doing at any given moment. Us Christians can be so wise in how we look at things and completely miss the offensive nature of the kingdom. Many years ago now, I studied to be a doctor. I worked in emergency medicine for a number of years, but all throughout the time that I was studying and working as a doctor, I knew that God had called me to do what I'm doing today. But I had felt God speak to me about going into medicine as a stepping stone into ministry because God does things in upside down ways. And anyway, that's what I did. When I heard God speak to me about coming out of medicine and going into full-time ministry in my, in my sixth year of practice, do you know who it was who told me that what I was doing was unwise? It wasn't the non-Christians around me. They were all like, wow, this is so brave. You're saying that God spoke to you? How did that even happen? They're asking questions, they're curious, they're celebrating. Do you know who told me it was unwise? It was Christians. Christians, no, can't, can't be God, makes no sense at all. According to which realm? Can't be God, it's a waste. According to which realm? Can't be God, he would never do something so strange. Have you even met him? We laugh, but oh my gosh, our communities are full of the wisdom of the age in how we weigh up what each other are experiencing, how we weigh up decisions that are being made, both individually and corporately, how we pursue the presence of God as if we have greater wisdom than God himself. No, no, Holy Spirit, you mustn't do that in our midst. This is a place that we want to see non-Christians saved and they won't get saved unless you sh if you show up in this way. Last time I checked, the only way people get saved is when the Holy Spirit shows up because it's by the Spirit of God that they say, Abba, Father. There is no other way to get saved. But we're applying the wisdom of the age consistently to how we live our lives and how we pursue his presence as if we're wiser than God and God will make the wisdom of man foolish. You are part of an offensive kingdom. Get used to it. Be gracious in your manner. But what sound are you making and agreeing with? There were people who heard the sound of Jesus, heard how un uncompromising he was because he was not deterred by the religious spirit or the wisdom of the age. He just kept making the sound of his kingdom. And there were those who heard that sound and started reverberating with the very same sound that he made. There were women like Mary who had been told their whole lives that they meant nothing, they were property, that they were lower than the least, that they needed to be silent, that their only role in life was to serve the men around them. But she heard the sound of a different kind of kingdom and she couldn't help herself. She had to be near Jesus. She had to learn from him. She had to follow him. And she breaks into the male only section of the party and she sits at the feet of Jesus, which by the way, isn't about proximity to Jesus, is about volunteering to be a disciple. You see that when you read Acts 22, that sitting at the feet of someone was about becoming the disciple of someone. Somebody. And so when we're told in the Gospel of Luke that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, she was literally saying, please pick me as your disciple, which was unthinkable in her day. And when her sister, operating in the wisdom of the age, shouts out, Jesus, tell her to come back and help me. She's not saying I need help in the kitchen. She's saying, remember your place. Get back in line. But Mary had heard the sound of a different kingdom and she would not be deterred by the lying wisdom of the age. 
but she saw him and she wanted him. And he says, she has chosen the good thing and it will not be taken away from her. I'm thinking of the woman who brings her alabaster jar. Again, male only section of the party. But she's heard a sound that's changed everything for her. And she will not be stopped from her worship. He is worthy of everything. And she breaks in. They'd be reclining at a table, which means she'd literally be moving people away. Oh, sorry, did I step on you? This is terrible in any culture, but in the ancient Middle East is horrific. She's stepping on people and pushing past people, and they are horrified. Who is this woman? How dare she? And she gets to Jesus, and she breaks this jar, and the smell, the fragrance of this ointment fills everywhere and she anoints him and she starts weeping and she lets down her hair, which is so offensive. That's what women did in the bedroom in front of their husband. It's an act of singular devotion and she's brought it into the public place. She is dirty now. She must be a prostitute. Who on earth does she think she is? Does she know who she's touching? And she's wiping his feet with her hair. And the religious are offended. Don't you know that that's a waste? That money should have been given to the poor. And they're disgusted with her. But of course, they become more disgusted with Jesus because he allows her to do what she's doing. She heard the sound of another kingdom and she cannot, cannot stop from worshiping no matter what the religious spirit will tell her. Because of course, it's not just an upside down kingdom or an offensive kingdom, but it's a transforming kingdom. It's a kingdom where you come into the presence of Jesus. And in the gospels, they stood face to face with Jesus. And in our day, we get the privilege of the spirit of God in our midst. But it's a kingdom where you come into contact with God, which is why incidentally we pursue the presence of God in our midst because it's only by contact with his presence that everything changes for us. But as we come into contact with him, we realize that Jesus wasn't just a good teacher or a a moral prophet or a a wacky thinker or an incredibly hippie-ish expression of love. No, he wasn't just that. He is savior and he is king. And he has come not just to make upside down or offensive noises, but he has come to make the sound of a transforming kingdom. Oswald Chambers says this, if Jesus is a teacher only, then all he can do is tantalize us by erecting a standard that we cannot come anywhere near. But if being born again from above, we know him first as savior, we know he did not come to teach us only, he came to make us what he teaches we should be. The Sermon on the Mount is a statement of the life we will live when the Holy Spirit is having his way with us. The very spirit of Jesus, the very spirit that raised him from the dead, that very spirit is in this room today. He is alive and well. He is living inside of every believer and he is begging every believer, let me out, let me flow from you, let me transform you inside out, not outside in, the way we like to do our morality accountability groups. No, let the Holy Spirit transform you from the inside out as he makes the sound of his kingdom come into contact with him allow his presence to overwhelm you so that every part of you begins to reverberate with the very same sound so that as you walk out of the building you become the sound of an incredibly powerful kingdom to transform the community that you live in there is no other way At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus commissions his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. That's what he says to them. Acts 1 tells us how they're to do that. Don't go anywhere without the power of the Spirit of God. 
You know what's so funny to me? Is so often you hear this argument in Christian circles. No, no, the Holy Spirit poured out like that is only for the apostles because they were so much greater than us. What's funny is that our logic is completely opposite to what we're saying. If you and I don't need the Spirit of God to achieve the mandate of God, that means we must be greater than the apostles somehow because they needed the power of the Spirit, but it's amazing, you and I can do all of it without His power. Seems like we've surpassed the apostles in this age. You cannot do any part of the Christian life (laughs) you cannot do any part of it without the power of the Spirit. Hear me here. These disciples in Acts 1 had believed in the risen Lord Jesus. They were saved. But there was more than the reality of their salvation that needed to happen. They needed the transforming of the presence and power power of the Spirit of God in order to do the impossible. You can be saved and get to heaven 100% by believing in Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, absolutely. But you cannot do the impossible without the power of the Spirit in your life. You cannot, you will never do it because the baptism of the Spirit is the moment the disciples went from weak Christians to impossible Christians. And you and I need to have the very same moment. There is no formula for it, there is no time for it. Some people, it happens the very minute they get saved, they get inundated by the presence of God. They get baptized with him, and we're gonna talk about that word baptized. There are for other Christians, it happens a little bit later on. They've been saved for a while, and the Holy Spirit pounces on them, and they get baptized regardless of time. I'm not saying there's a formula. I'm not saying it has to look the same for everybody, but every Christian needs to be filled with the presence of God in order to do the miraculous. Jesus says to them, don't go anywhere because I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That word baptize is the word immerse. And it's a word that was actually used in the ancient Middle East in recipes for pickling. You go in a cucumber, you come out a pickle. You know what my really religious prayer of the morning was? Pickle us, Holy Spirit. Pickle us. That's what it means to be a people of the presence of God. That's what it means to host the presence of Jesus in our community. It doesn't mean that we get goosebumps once in a while. It doesn't mean that some random preacher comes and says, hey, once in a while and confuses people. That's not the point. The point is, what did you come in and what did you go out? Have you been pickled in the spirit of God is my question to you. There is no other way to do the impossible. You will be in the kingdom, but you won't make the sound of the kingdom until you've been pickled by the Spirit of God. If there's one thing you remember today, remember this. Be pickled by the Spirit of God. Oh, Lord, where do we go from here? Okay. (laughs) Bill Johnson says this. The nature of our call is that it requires more than we are capable of. When we stick to doing only the stuff we can do, we are not involved in the call. Jesus lived in constant confrontation and conflict with the world around him because kingdom logic goes against carnal logic. This is a good time to ask yourself, are you living in conflict with this world? A renewed mind sees the way God sees. A renewed mind destroys the works of the devil so that earthly reality matches heavenly reality. It heals the sick. It frees those enslaved to sin, brings joy where there was sadness, strength where there was weakness. That's normal Christian living. I wanna end with a story from Greek mythology and then we're gonna do some ministry if that's okay. In Greek mythology, there's this island that was filled with these horrific demonized women called the Sirens. And they would 
make this beautiful, sing this beautiful melody that would draw sailors past, draw them to their island, and then they would kill them, and they would destroy them. And in Greek mythology, there's two different heroes that pass that island and are unique in that they pass by unscathed. And the first is a man called Odysseus. And he wants to pass by the island, but he's been warned about these sirens. He's been warned about how evil they are and that it will surely lead to death if they pass that island. But he's got a great idea. He tells all of his men to put wax in their ears so they won't hear the sound and they'll be able to pass by unscathed. But he wants to hear the sound. He's curious about the sound. So he gets them to bind him to the mast of the ship. He leaves his ears open so he can hear the sound, but he is bound so he cannot do what his heart wants to, and they pass by unscathed. The second hero is a man called Jason. He also has been warned about the sirens and the haunting melody that they will sing that will lead the men to their death. And so he hires another man called Orpheus. Orpheus is a man who plays beautiful music. And what happens is, as they come to the island with the sirens, Orpheus begins to make a melody. And the sirens sing their song, and they sing their song, and they sing their song, and Orpheus makes his sound and plays his sound. And no matter how beautifully the sirens sing, the sound of the melody that Orpheus makes is a superior sound. And so no matter what noise the sirens make, Jason and his men are able to pass safely because they are captivated by a superior sound. What sound has caught your heart? Sometimes in churches we act like Odysseus We bind our hands because we're interested in external behavior modification rather than realizing that if we submit ourselves to the pickling of the spirit, our hearts will be one so that we hear a superior sound and reverberate with that thing. He is not interested in controlling your behavior. He is interested in making your heart whole. There is a complete difference. Won't you stand with me for a moment?